everyone, and welcome to our Research Life webinar today, The Future of Pharma Covalent Exploring Automation and AI in Literature Surveillance. We're really happy that you've decided to join us today for this exciting webinar. Um, we'll give people just another second here to, to join in. If you want to go ahead and grab yourself uh, another cup of coffee or something else to drink, depending on where you are right now, feel free to do that. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Okay, let me present our speakers today. Um, so we have Andrew Pritchett, Director of Pharma Covigilance at ICON, join us today, as well as Chris Vandell, Director of Product Strategy at Research Solutions. Welcome, Andrew and Chris. And let me also briefly introduce myself. My name is Julia Heaton. I'm Senior Growth Marketing Manager at Research Solutions. And as you can probably already tell, I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Um, so a couple of housekeeping items just before I hand it over and we dive right in. Um, you're all listen in mouth, you don't have to worry about background noise um, whatsoever. Um, we have live screen enabled, so on the Zoom bar below, um, it says Q&A, so you can add your questions as soon as they come up. We will have dedicated time to answer all of your questions at the end of the webinar, um, but you can add them as soon as they come up so you don't forget. Um, and then also, um, this webinar is being recorded, so if you want to move up a specific part later or you want to share the recording with a colleague, you don't have to worry about that. Um, probably no more than an hour after the webinar, I'll be sending um, the webinar recording to all of you. Um, okay, then just a few settings about Research Solutions, the company behind this Research Life webinar today. Uh, Research Solutions was founded in 2006, and we provide solutions that simplify and streamline how organizations discover, acquire, manage, and create scientific articles and data. Today, more than 70% of the top pharmaceutical companies, prestigious universities, emerging businesses rely on our family's products that are powered by AI and NLP technology. Okay, with that um, being said, uh, Chris, handing it over to you. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, throughout the webinar today, we're going to have three polls focused around questions uh, about AI uh, and how it can be leveraged for pharmacovigilance and especially for literature monitoring. So the first poll today, and we'll give you a bit of time, like 30 seconds, to provide some input here, and then we can address this a little bit, uh, especially in the Q&A. So the first question is, in your opinion, what is the most significant benefit of integrating AI into pharmacovigilance literature monitoring? Is it increased efficiency and speed? Is it improved accuracy in identifying relevant literature? Is it the enhanced ability to predict and identify safety signals? Or is it cost reduction throughout the literature monitoring processes? And we'll give you another few 10 or 20 seconds to provide your input. A lot of people feeling it all already. I see the little percentage bar dropping up and down. <laughs> Always fun. Okay, I think pretty much everyone filled it out. Chris, am I good to share results? Yep, go for it. All right, so what do we have here? 36% say it's about efficiency and speed, 28% helping to identify relevant literature, and 32% about predicting and identifying safety signals. Thank you very much. And we can talk about that a bit later. All right, so we'll move on and I'll hand over to Andrew um, and I'll be talking to you a little bit later. Thank you, uh, Chris, and, and thank you, everybody, for, for, for joining today's session and for taking part in the poll. Um, I think you'll see as we go through that um, we, we tend to agree with you um, with, with the areas that we think AI can can benefit uh, PV. So, um, yeah, we're going to move through now and talk about um, the, the future of PV um, around automation and, and, and AI. So we have uh, a few learning objectives um, for today's uh, session. So. I'll start um, with the first uh, three items here. So I'll talk about the role of literature surveillance in pharmacovigilance for pharmaceutical and biotech companies and, and, and CROs like ICON, um, where we see benefits in automating and streamlining literature review, um, how we as ICON are, are proactively using uh, technology to automate 
um, these processes. And then we, I'll hand over to Chris um, and he'll talk about the current industry, industry landscape, um, future projections for, for the field, um, particularly around AI and then potential impact um, on, on the industry. Okay, so if we uh, if we move forward, so a large amount of us in the audience, I'm sure, are, are, are well versed on on, on pharmacovigilance, and and we know that uh, in PV literature is is a key source of of safety information um, throughout the whole product lifecycle. Um, during clinical development, there may not be a huge amount of literature that we find that's that's hugely relevant. We we may not find ICSRs. Um, in in that stage, but nevertheless, it's still a source for, of of safety information that we might use for for different types of of, of PV. Um, when we move to a commercial setting, if the product moves that far in in development and moves to the you know it's, it's a marketed product and moves to commercialization, then of course things might might change, and we we'd expect then to see a, a different landscape. You know, more more um, information come out of literature. It's a, it's in a real world environment then, so it's, you know the products are being exposed to. To different types of environments, so then we know we're more likely, or we'd expect to see, you know, ICSRs or, or changes in the safety profile as we move into a real world setting. But, you know, some of the re some of the, the ways we use literature in 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 PV, and again, this would be pr pretty familiar to, to to a lot of you, is we of course look for case reports, um, and as I mentioned, in a clinical setting, we we might not see them in literature because they would typically be reported um, in, in a study. So we might not see ICSRs in in a clinical setting, but certainly when we move to commercialization. Um, we will see more, more ICSRs. Um, we're going to look for safety information about the, the product. Maybe there's some risks that we already know. Um, maybe it's a biosimilar or a product of a similar class, like a benzodiazepine. So we might be able to predict uh, risks. So we might look for certain types of uh, safety information. Um, and and they, they may feed into other reports that we prepare within within PV, um, pre and pro post, uh, post approval. So our grid safety reports, things like, you know, your DSURs, your your PSURs, your PIBAs. Um, you know, there's a section in there to describe literature. Um, if we do signal detection and if we need to do signal validation, we might need to do some additional literature searches to to look at things we might might find within within the signal detection process. If we're writing risk management plans, particularly post approval, um, there's an epidemiology section and that would also require some literature searching because, you know, we need to look at categorization of the risk and things like that so we'd work with the epidemiologist and 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 write that part of the of the plan uh, again in a, in a in a real world setting you know we need to also start looking locally so as product moves into different markets uh, globally you know those those cases can sometimes be presented locally before they get into pubmed or mbase so we you know we also you know need to look there and and then you know more targeted or, or systematic type reviews. So if there's a particular research question, you know we also might do some literature surveillance in terms of, you know, like a systematic or meta analysis where we have a certain research question that we're we're trying to answer again, working with the real world or epidemiology teams. So that's the sort of framework. And and then what do we do? You know, how do we start literature? So whenever we we think about okay, we have a certain objective. So that's the first thing. You know, what's the objective of the search? Is it for looking for case reports, or do we have a research question that we might like to answer? So we that's the first thing that we need to think about is what's the objective, um, and then from that we can we can think about developing a, a search strategy. And ultimately, the search strategy is is critical in in the success of of our our research. We at Icon work with a librarian, and I, and I really recommend working with a librarian for this type of search strategy design because they're really experts in information research. And they can help with developing a strategy that's objective and based upon what we're trying to achieve. Um, it can contain, you know, different types of uh, operators, Boolean operators, mesh terms, um, ways to target um, a, a certain uh, type of, of product um, to ensure that we, you know, we have a precise recall as, as much as we can. Um, so what we'll do is we'll include, you know, any certain risks within the strategy, any anything that we might be particularly looking for. Um, and then we'll, you know, we'll test the strategy, validate the strategy, and that's really critical um, because it'll allow us to get a sense for, you know, is is it effective? Um, I mentioned precision and recall. That is an ongoing um, process that we look at with our strategies. So, you know, obviously we we don't want to have a too broad of a recall because then we potentially are going to spend a lot of time, you know, reviewing information that isn't going to be relevant. So we need to be precise um, in the recall that we get. So if, if you know, for example, we were to get a thousand hits or abstracts and only 
100 of those were, were relevant, then that's only a 10% recall, which, you know, isn't isn't great. You know, we're spending a lot of time then reviewing information that's never going to be relevant for the product. So, you know, it's never going to be 100% precise, but, you know, we want to try to get it as high as we can. And the librarian can help with that. And, you know, I say here also, you know, we it's an ongoing process, strategy design. You know, we, we develop it initially and it evolves with the product. So as the product moves through the, the life cycle, as we mo learn more about the product, then we need to keep changing the strategy. Um, we might learn new risks. We might learn new things about the product. We might think that it's not effective. Um, technology can help us, as I'll talk about later, with with monitoring the effectiveness of the strategy. But at the moment, it needs to it needs to grow and evolve with 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 the product as well. So moving uh, moving forward, uh, some of the some of the benefits that we see at Icon um, in terms of of automation and what we've done at Icon to to streamline our our review process. So we have a tool, a, a literature tool that again is something that I I, I always recommend, particularly um, for customers that have large volumes um, of data. Um, the tool can can really help with with standardizing, um, automating a lot of the a lot of the the, the the literature review. We you know we want to try to move away from Excel trackers and things like that. So you know having a literature tool is is really allowing us to be audit ready and inspection ready. And there's a lot of, as I say, automation within that type of tool that can can help to speed up the reviews and, and actually get us to, to the safety information quicker. A, a lot of these tools have an AI functionality. Chris will talk about this a little bit later on, but but there's ways that the tool can machine learn and get through some of the higher volume. Um, a lot of it is repeatable. You know, when we're looking at abstracts, you, you know, we know what we're looking for. So that the tool, the machine can learn that and, and it can take away some of the burden of the higher volume reviews. So that's something that we also we, we also you know look at at Icon. And then there's other ways you know to use AI. We have uh, NLP. So we also apply NLP for our full text documents. So again, ways to get through high volume papers um, and, and try to pull out the really relevant safety information. And then we also you know, try to link the tool with other platforms that we have within the organization. So a platform like an article procurement software, um, that is a way, again, to reduce the amount of manual touch points between, uh, between, the, different, uh, between the different systems. So to sort of summarize a little bit, a little, go a little bit further with, with some of the benefits that we said I've gone with, with, with automation of, of literature is, well, first of all, it, it cuts the review times. So you know, all, the, all of those things I mentioned on the previous slide, you know, there's AI functionality, there's machine learning, it, it cuts the review times, you know, it has other different types of functionality, like, you know, deduplication, keyword highlighting. So, you know, there's ways that we can reduce the review times, people can review in parallel. So the sort of start to end time is much shorter. Um, we've typically seen around a 75% reduction in review times since we've implemented the tool. So it's quite a substantial amount of reduction um, that obviously leads to reduced costs. Um, of course, there's maybe an initial investment at the beginning, you know, with with building a tool or, or working with a vendor to, to to implement a tool. But you know, longer term, it's going to reduce costs for for you as an organization. Or if you're a or a, a CRO like Icon, it allows us to reduce our costs for our customers. Uh, that also you know makes us a little bit more competitive. It allows us to get the safety information faster, which I've alluded to on the previous slide. You know, we want our teams to spend the time doing the scientific research. We don't want them to spend time trailing through hundreds and thousands of abstracts if there's not much there that's relevant. So if the machine can do that for us and spit out, you know, what is relevant, then the, 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 the teams can actually spend the time looking at that. And, and that's the sort of scientific piece of the literature. Get, so it's getting us to the, to the safety information, whether that's ICSRs or, or risks or whatever it might be, you know, much, much faster. Obviously, it's scalable. You know, if we in the past, you know, we we if and when we've used Excel trackers, that isn't really scalable. You know, if we have a product that has hundreds of thousands of papers, I mean, that's just that's just not that's just not scalable. It's not it's not uh, manageable. So, you know, the tool does all of that for us. It does a lot of it in the background. We can ingest, you know, an unlimited amount of data into into the tool. Um, so it's 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 scalable. So as the product grows, as it scales, as it goes into the real world, you know we don't have any limitations with with scalability. And as I alluded to earlier, ultimately it allows us to be audit and inspection ready. We don't have any gaps. Um, everything is is traceable. Everything is part of the audit trail. We're able to recreate everything we do. 
Um, so if an auditor or inspector comes along and asks us to recreate uh, why we decided a certain abstract wasn't relevant or why, why we took a certain decision, it's all within the application and it's easy to extract that out and, and even provide it to customers. If we have customers that need to see certain reports, um, we're able to do that much, much quicker. Okay, so moving on now a little bit more talk, to talk about how Icon is 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 using technology, including including Article Galaxy Procuma software um, to automate a, a little bit our process. So as I've alluded to already, maybe once or twice, you know, the, the amount of literature can be quite overwhelming, um, particularly if it's um, a strategy that isn't very precise. And as I, you know, as I talked about, you know, that will evolve with time, but there might be a period of time where the volume is quite high and you, you happen to spend time reviewing information that, that isn't relevant. Um, that is obviously going to increase your costs. Um, it's not very enjoyable for the teams. Um, it's not very motivating um, for them to have to sit there and, and review things that is never going to be relevant. So the resources involved are not going to be very motivated by that. So we found that since we've implemented the technology, it also helps with team motivation and morale and helps them to enjoy the work because they're spending more time on the scientific piece of the, on the, of the work. We also are looking at ways where we can map and integrate the tool, um, or you, or maybe even better use the tool. So there's 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 implementing the tool, but there's also being pragmatic and thinking about, okay, what functionality do I need as an organization at this point in time? You know, when you implement a tool, you might not need all of the functionality on day one. You might need to take a stepwise approach and, and build up to then increase in the functionality. And that is something that we've been doing at Icon. You know, we have the tool. We've been using the tool. It's a sort of proof of concept for a period of time. And now we're, we're adding on additional functionalities as it makes sense for us as an organization, as our customers have asked for that. So that is something that having a tool allows us to be able to do. Um, and also, we, we are integrating the tool in our ecosystem at Icon. So it might be a standalone tool when we invest in it, but over time, we want to build it into the ecosystem that we have. So, you know, we work with uh, the Article Galaxy. That's another way that we integrate. Um, we are also looking at integrating our tool with our safety database, with our signal detection tool. So again, additional ways to reduce the manual touch points so that we don't have to extract things from one tool and put it into another tool we can sort of push and pull the data between the systems. So again, that's another way to increase the automation and to reduce cost and reduce the, the manual touch points between, between the steps. So that's also a, a part of the sort of wider ecosystem um, at Icon. So again, we it's a journey, you know, and we've taken this journey at Icon and it has to be, you know, we have to do it sensibly and pragmatically. You know, it's not going to suit all customers and all co companies to do that at one time. But as the right time comes, you know, I always really recommend, you know, thinking about, you know, exploring these types of tools and, and bringing them into your organization. I think with with that, I have two more slides or one more slide. Um, <laughs> so maybe what I would recommend, yeah, just a little bit summarize what I've said already. You know, we avoid the use of manual trackers. I've already said this quite a few times now. Um, so we really recommend in, in investing again at the right time for the company. In, in a literature tool, because it allows us to, you know, ingest multiple sources. Um, as I said before, PubMed, Embase, there'll be a lot of local journals potentially when a when a product's marketed. And there's benefits in in, in having a tool, like I mentioned earlier, it'll deduplicate for you, it'll, it'll do lots of different things to to automate and, and, and streamline the results. Um, it, can, it can monitor the effectiveness of your strategy. I, I talked about this earlier, we, we have to evolve the strategy as it goes through the product life, product life cycle. And, and by having the strategy within a tool, the tool will actually generate some KPIs and metrics for us. And it'll tell us, okay, in any given month, this is how effective the strategy has been. And that might then prompt us to go back to our librarian maybe a bit sooner and ask her to take another look at the strategy and maybe to revise um, to make it a little bit more precise. And again, you know, some of the, some of the functionalities I've already talked about here um, in, in sort of a little bit summary. So some of the benefits of a tool, um, a lot of the tools have these similar types of benefits, but again, it really um, positions you as an organization um, for, for you know, moving forward as a company. It, it just makes a little bit, the process a little bit more sophisticated. Okay, that was my last slide. <laughs> okay, so I think with that, we have uh, the, second, uh, the second polling question. Yeah, so poll number two, 
what are what concerns do you have about relying on AI for literature monitoring in pharmacovigilance? And we have five choices this time: loss of human oversight, AI understanding context and nuance in literature, potential for data breaches and privacy issues, high costs of AI implementation and maintenance, or something else. So again, we'll give you like another 20 seconds or so to provide your input here. Okay, it looks like we've got all. Uh, let's look at the results here. All right, we have in the lead by quite a margin uh, the second one, 65% AI understanding context and nuance in literature. Um, so, and then followed by high cost of AI, AI implementation, and then loss of human oversight and potential for data breaches and privacy issues. Um, there was a response, maybe on other, or maybe we can see that later. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, so other would be how AI would weed out predatory publications and paper mills. That's very good. Okay, so now for the second section, uh, I am going to be first providing a brief overview of some of the technologies that Andrew already mentioned and a few others. Um, so mentioning you know, the key terms uh, which you may already be familiar, familiar with uh, and how they can be leveraged for pharmacovigilance. And then I'll also be introducing uh, a few tools that Research Solutions has that can work together as part of a literature monitoring workflow. So for this first overview, there's a few key technologies. Andrew mentioned two of these already. So natural language processing and machine learning. Natural language processing or NLP is very good for helping to identify key terms, concepts, entities, uh, data points within unstructured data. So clinical trial information, electronic health records, and indeed scientific literature uh, and peer reviewed journals, for instance. Um, so NLP, very useful for detecting this information, also very often being leveraged as part of an overall uh, search system for helping to identify the correct articles that you want to look at. Machine learning uh, comes in, in a variety of different types. As the name indicates, this is all about the algorithm being able to learn about what it is trying to analyze and understand often in an unsupervised mode or supervised with the application of certain training data sets, um, but very useful to be, be able to find patterns and also being leveraged more for also predictive analytics. The next two technologies are very closely related to machine learning, um, really sort of building on uh, machine learning in, in very sophisticated ways. Large language models, you will have heard a lot about these the last year and a half, the most famous being ChatGPT. So a large language model is uh, an algorithm or a system which has been trained on very, very large corpus of information. ChatGPT, for instance, has been trained on most of what can be found on the web. And these large language models are very useful for also part of um, a search strategy, be able to find information, uh, but also very useful for helping to comprehend very quickly what information is about by creating summaries, which are very, you know, in formats, which are very easy to, to use or consume. Um, and you're able to sort of define how, how broad or focused those summaries can be. Large language models, of course, you will all have heard come with a variety of challenges. Uh, we will be talking about some of the solutions to those challenges a little bit later, uh, but those challenges being around the transparency of these LLMs, uh, also that they are often creating sort of 
information that may not be actual factual, so so-called hallucinations. Um, but there's a lot of innovation going on to improve this from the creators of LLMs and also people like ourselves, our company, who leverage them for our products. Then generative AI. So generative AI, often people when people say generative AI, they also are referring to large language models and also the ability to generate summaries, uh, to generate images, etc., and so on. Um, but another very specific application is related to so-called generative adversarial networks. And these are for creating synthetic data, which can be very useful when the real data um, is either limited or cannot be used for, for privacy or ethical reasons. So I think, you know, patient health records, uh, private information that you don't want to use in a model um, for doing predictive uh, sort of tasks. Um, but in those cases, you can create so-called synthetic data. The way this works is that you essentially have two neural networks, or it's a type of machine learning network. One is trying to create data which is matching or very similar to real-world data that you're showing it, and another one which is constantly checking to see how similar it is until they create synthetic data, which can be used um, very effectively for, for modeling a predictive task. So for instance, predicting the outcome of, of a clinical trial, for instance. All right, so if we move on, we'll have a little bit of a closer look at, in particular, sort of generative AI and how, you know, the benefits it provides for literature monitoring. So there are, here there are various tasks, first of all, kind of listed here, automated literature searches, data extraction, summarization, signal detection, all topics that Andrew was uh, also addressing. And being able to automate these tasks, being able to leverage uh, generative AI and other AI systems for these tasks really helps, as we already saw, in enhancing the decision-making process, making it much more efficient. These are systems that are continuously improving, learning as they go along, um, ensuring that you can really meet your regulatory um, uh, yeah, compliance um, um, tasks that you need to do. And the other final thing, which is very useful about these systems is that they can equally be applied very easily to multilingual content. So the ability for these systems to do you know, on the spot translation is very, very good. Um, and so, yeah, now, you know, it's the whole world of literature out there can now be ra rapidly um, used in, in the same way. Um, if we look at some of the benefits and the challenges, we already saw that there are a lot of benefits around efficiency and speed, um, also the comprehensiveness of these systems and, and cost effectiveness. And in the first poll, you know, we kind of identified that especially efficiency and speed is a, a really critical um, aspect that you also think is important here. Um, and indeed, we also saw and heard from Andrew that these are uh, systems that really make the process very scalable as well. There are, of course, a whole range of challenges. Um, there is, however, a lot of innovation happening in this space. We are seeing improvements here all the time, and I think a lot of these will really be addressed in the next year or two, so that many of these challenges here will actually become benefits as well. As you know, various players in the field are working to decrease bias of these systems, the increasing the security and privacy of these systems um, and ensuring that the information they are providing, you can have um, a lot of confidence in uh, and therefore, you know, being able to benefit from those efficiencies with confidence is, is the goal here. If we now look at the competitive landscape, um, it's getting quite busy. There are a lot of tools out there now leveraging uh, AI in, in various ways to address use cases in PV and literature monitoring. Many of the tools shown here are systematic review tools that also have literature monitoring um, aspect to them. Also listing here, of course, the more manual uh, ways that things have been done uh, until recently and potentially still being done by, by some. Uh, so starting from your PubMed or Embase um, search and that, but ending up sort of, you know, using Excel spreadsheets for, for tracking this information. Um, so really helping to move away from that manual process. Um, there, yeah, there are a lot of different tools here. Some of 
of them have been around quite a while and some of them are much newer. And we will have a look in a moment at three of these, uh, which are from our company, Research Solutions, which are site, Resolute.ai, and Qdatas. If we move on, uh, I'll talk a little bit more now about those tools in particular. So these are tools that Research Solutions only very recently in the last six months acquired. Research uh, Resolute.ai is a search and discovery platform, a very comprehensive one, which includes a lot of different types of data sets. So not only scientific journal literature, but also clinical trial information, patent information, relevant FDA databases, uh, also competitive intelligence information as well. The magic here is that Resolute.ai do a lot of work in enhancing the metadata of all this content that they are enabling search across and also associating uh, relevant life sciences, in particular life science taxonomies and ontologies to further enhance um, the, the search and discovery potential here, and enhancing uh, what was mentioned before, which was that precision and, and recall um, of, of the searches. Site.ai is also a search and discovery platform, but focused on uh, scientific journal literature in particular. There, Secret Source is something a little bit different. They have been able to acquire text and data mining rights from the majority of scientific publishers of journals. So they are able to mine that full text and what they mine are the citations in the articles. Not only the references themselves, um, but also the context. So a few sentences before and after so that the context and also the sentiment being expressed by um, the journal articles, which are doing these references. So whether the reference that they are citing is, is supported by the research, which is being published in the article, or if in fact it is being contrasted by what this particular journal article has found out. So site has been able to um, mine around 2 billion citation statements uh, from all these journal articles, and now make that part of a, a searchable uh, interface. We now have at Research Solutions a variety of tools. Uh, you've just heard about Site and Resolute.ai. Uh, we also have Qadatus, which is a systematic review tool. And we've also heard about Article Galaxy, which where we can provide access to any and all journal articles. And as we look at you know, a complete literature monitoring workflow, you can see how these different tools can be used and leveraged at each point along that workflow. Some of these are very new, as we say, just recently acquired, and we're doing a lot of work in the next six months to a year to now bring these all together and integrate them. So from a user point of view, for you in future, you'll have a seamless user experience as you go through this process. Um, for, for your literal monitoring tasks. I will now introduce a little bit more detail each of the products and how they're relevant to literature monitoring. So on the next slide, we have, first of all, oh, sorry, but one more important thing. Both site.ai and resolute.ai do leverage large language models, not only to let, as part of some of the search experiences that they are supporting, uh, so it's natural language searching, but also in generating summaries of in individual articles or content items, but also um, a number of journal articles and content items. As if we just stay back on, on that slide a second, as you, you heard before, large language models in particular have transparency issues, trust issues, uh, producing hallucinations sometimes, and some ways around that now, or one particular way that um, a lot of people in, in the industry are now able to leverage LLMs, but make them more transparent and trustworthy is part of a so-called RAG architecture. So this RAG means retrieval augmented generation. And what this really refers to is that instead of just accepting what the LLM has been trained on, you know, everything which is on the web and expecting it to provide information accurately back from there, the LAM, instead, the framework is focused just on the curated data sets that we wanted to, to focus on. So in the case of Resolute.ai, that might be scientific journal literature and clinical trials and patents. 
in the case of Saitai, that's just the 2 billion citations that they've extracted from all those journal articles. So through implementing a RAG architecture, that means those issues that people have in terms of transparency and trust go away, are much improved because the original content is or, or always referred to. You can go back and see the original uh, information and it greatly, greatly reduces the incidences of hallucinations. Okay, the next one. So yeah, brief overview now of each of the three products and how they're relevant to literature monitoring. Uh, I already referred to Cite.ai and their smart citations. So their ability to show the context of citations, how they support or contrast each other, which helps greatly to speed up your understanding of whether an article will be important for you or not. As part of, you know, a, a true literature monitoring process, in, this needs to be auditable and reproducible. So the search strategies have to uh, be well documented, um, have to be able to support, you know, as we heard, good precision and recall. Uh, and so, for instance, site does leverage taxonomies such as MeSH and PubChem to help with this and also full documentation of the search terms, the filters, the dates, and so on. In addition, a very unique thing about this product is its comprehensive retraction monitoring. This combines the power of the smart citations with an automated editorial retraction notice uh, detection so that you know when some of the articles that you've been monitoring in, until now are retracted, that you can immediately find out about that. As I mentioned, it uses ChatGPT uh, as part of a generative AI supported search, that's Site Assistant, but only focused on the 2 billion citation uh, database, um, which is sort of the core of this product. And it, it is completely integrated with Article Galaxy. So when you need the full text, you can immediately get it. On the next slide, we're looking at Resolute.ai. As I mentioned before, they're very, very good at enhancing the metadata of the content and the data that they have in this very comprehensive search tool, supported by very advanced search um, abilities, a Boolean search, of course, and semantic expansion. So being able to very, to help a lot in creating search strategies which are precise and, and, and provide really good recall. Also supported by a range of life science relevant taxonomies and ontologies. In addition, they provide a lot of visual analytics to further refine searches and therefore make the searches much more precise. Also, safe searches and alerts are there. Full documentation of the searches are there for, for the regulatory processes. Providing generative AI summaries, again, just focused on the content which has been defined and with a full integration again with Article Galaxy for full text access. And the final product to look at is Curidatus. This is the systematic review uh, product that can be used for literature monitoring. So here, once you've done your, your search in PubMed, in Embase, in Sight, or Resolute, you can bring those abstracts into Curidatus. There's an automated AI system for Pico labeling. You can then access the full text via Article Galaxy. You can also use this tool then for annotating the content. Um, and then extracting the information from the full text um, as part of your literary monitoring process. And also, of course, in line with things like Prisma guidelines, um, et cetera. All right, so those were those three products. As I said, some of them we've only just recently brought in to our sort of product ecosystem, and we'll be working hard this year to actually change the user experience, make it one streamlined process for someone doing literal monitoring to go through all these tasks and, and make the most of these products and how they can support uh, a literature monitoring workflow. And with that, that, we come to our last poll. And poll number three is, how do you perceive the future role of AI in pharmacovigilance? Um, and what we have here is AI will completely replace human roles in literature monitoring. AI will augment human capabilities, but not replace them. AI will play a minor role with humans remaining the primary drivers or unsure. And again, we'll give you 20, to, 20 seconds or so to answer there.
Okay, it looks like we're set. Let's look at the results here. Thanks, everyone. Well, yes, so very much definitely AI will augment human capabilities, but not replace them. Um, I think that kind of also relates back to what we saw in the first poll as well, um, where you know, it was really about improving efficiency and things like that, rather than you know, huge major you know, cost improvements because you don't need a PV team anymore or anything like that. Um, but really, yeah, augmenting human capabilities to be much more efficient in this process, uh, much more accurate in the process of, of literal monitoring in, in PV. All right, so with that, we can now go to the Q&A. And Julia, what do we, Yeah. what questions just, do we have? Yeah, just one second right before the q and uh, see we have a lot of questions already, so thanks for adding those. Um, so just in case you saw um, or one of the products that either Andrew or Chris mentioned today that you'd want to learn a bit more about that, I'm adding a link in the chat as we speak right now. Feel free to head over there and um, ask for more information, um, see how that would apply for your specific use case, and we'd be happy to talk to you about that. Uh, okay, now Q&A, my favorite part of these webinars. Um, so there's one, um, when I'm not exactly sure what it refers to, but you might understand that better, it, um, it says, what about literature in other languages? I'm not sure if this refers to the access of literature in different uh, languages or... So, um, yeah, there's two aspects of that. Um, in most cases, a lot of the the tools that are that are used typically for search and discovery are also indexing content in other languages. Um, but yeah, one of the, the key benefits of AI systems, which I highlighted, is that you know translation of content is now very, very straightforward, often of a very high quality. And so the, yeah, these systems, the AI in particular, is helping a lot for people not only to find relevant content in other languages, but then to assess how relevant it is and then you know extract the information from that content that they need. Awesome, thank you so much. And if there's a follow-up question on that, feel free to um, add it here. Um, okay, the next one is, have you seen an increase of requests or questions regarding AI in the last year? Maybe I can take that one, yeah. uh, Julia, Chris, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So, no. so I think the answer, the, the short answer to that is is yes. Um, you know, obviously, Icon as a company, we are a service provider, and so um, we get a lot of requests for support from our customers. And what we've seen is a, a definitely an, an upward trend in in customers expecting um, Icon to have solutions that have AI. Um, Obviously, as a company, we, we're doing a lot of, of different things within within the organization around AI, not only within PV, um, but but yeah, that's becoming much more of an expectation. So I think as a company, as a service provider, in order to stay competitive um, as a healthcare company, we need to be invested in AI um, sensibly, um, organically to a certain degree. Uh, but yes, we certainly are now seeing, I wouldn't say every uh, request, but certainly is an upward tra trajectory of of requests coming through that have, a, have an AI component to it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know, Chris, if you had anything else to add to that. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely. Everyone is using more and more AI also in their, you know, private lives and so on and increasing for other work tasks. I think it's, it's clear the benefits that, that, that everyone can have from AI. And it's just about making sure that some of those challenges which I mentioned in terms of privacy and data security and things like that, that people can, that solutions are provided that provide people confidence in the systems uh, themselves. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you both. Um, what are other plans to integrate AI? So maybe I can again start mm -hmm. with that's okay. <laughs> I sort of yeah. I, I sort of alluded to this briefly in my in my previous response. So um you know, obviously here we're talking about about pharmacovigilance and particularly literature, but we, you know, with an icon, we have, you know, several different tools that help us with with AI. So um, to give you an example, we we have developed a tool that helps predict post-marketing safety uh, expectations for from the FDA and the EMA um, based on, on previous approvals that we've, we've seen. So there's, you know, that tool helps us support our customers 
get ready for a post approval stage in in what the the regulators might expect them to do. Um, you know, that's again linked to pharmacovigilance to a certain degree, but also to the wider sort of commercial strategy that the customer would have. Um, you know, there's there's other areas within the organisation as well that that can help with you know that can be helped by 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 AI. Um, and you know, as an organisation, we we continue to look at at that. Um, but yeah, maybe that's I'll stop there and you know let Chris um, add add anything from from his perspective as well. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things which I mentioned was generative AI and in particular the, this generative adversarial networks and the ability to create synthetic data. So being able to then leverage data free of privacy and ethical constraints, which can be used for you know especially some of those use cases, predictive use cases. Uh, for instance, yeah, predicting the, the, the outcomes of clinical trials, um, but also being able to predict when and where, you know, signals could be expected um, within the literature about, you know, whatever the topics you're looking at. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next one is, this is geared towards companies, but will this be available or accessible to a single person consultant who may be working for a client that doesn't use these? So the the tools we showed. Yeah, I think these are referring to to the. the yeah, so. I think you know at least from for our tools, typically we have also business models that support individuals or, or small companies. So yeah, they're also definitely available for for yeah not just it's not just for for big companies as well. Awesome. Okay. And then under the, the same link that I shared previously, um, feel free to head over there and we'd be happy to uh, show you how that works for an individual offline as well. Um, okay, I see one more question here. So if any other questions come up, feel free to add them in right now. Um, why we would like to use LL LLMs, are companies still very reluctant due to security and privacy reasons? What are some ways around this? Yeah, so I think these issues are also well understood by the providers of large language models. So OpenAI, Google, Microsoft, etc. Um, so they're doing a lot now to you know create systems which ensure that data that you're providing or querying on or the queries themselves uh, are not saved or, or do not inform the training of the the large language models however there's still you know some some security you know hesitancy definitely around using these essentially public large language models and i think what we're going to see in the next year or two and it's something especially larger companies are already looking very seriously at and that is actually creating their own large language models or indeed something which is known as a small uh, language model, which are then, you know, the same concept of, of language models, but then very much focused on a specific domain. So it becomes something that you don't need, you know, billions of, of, of dollars to create um, as, as OpenAI needed to do, but you're able to then train the same types of technology on, on smaller, much more focused data sets. Um, and these things then can be completely in-house completely on-prem uh, and therefore, you know, getting around some of those security issues. Um, and I also just saw one other question in the chat related to, I think, one of the polls that we did. And that was, how would we, how, uh, yeah, how can AI help to weed out predatory publications and paper mill literature? So especially generative AI, large language models are leading to a big increase in in, in sort of fake articles. And yeah, some tools are starting to be created that helps to detect these types of articles, but we still see that the publishers are struggling a little bit. Um, so things like the retraction watch technology that we provide help there, but also tools like Sight, which are able to sort of show a lot of more in-depth information around the sentiment, around the citations that are in these articles or that are citing these other articles will help also to provide better context to understand which articles are, are really meaningful uh, and will be useful for, for the questions that you have. 
so yeah, it's a problem, but I think we'll also see some more innovation there and different ways these tools can be used to help weed out these, these fake articles. Amazing. Thank you, Chris, also for taking that uh, question in the comments. Um, are regulatory approvals for artificial intelligence technologies domain specific, such as NLP may be approved, while other subfields, subfields like deep learning are not, uh, and so on? Um, say, say, could you just repeat that one more time? Of course. <laughs> Long question. Are regulatory approvals for artificial intelligence technologies domain specific such that NLP may be approved, but other subfields such as deep learning are not? Yeah, right. So I think there's definitely, I guess, some some a lot of catch up happening in terms of helping to get some of these tools approved from from regulatory perspective. I think. You know, that's also in regards to leveraging AI as part of things like med tech. So having AI as part of a medical device, um, you know, I think there's there, there's a lot of potential there for the med, med tech industry. But this is, you know, the regulatory processes, I think, I don't, I'm not an expert on that, but I think uh, I need to have some catch up there. In terms of the actual tools that you know we showed here and which were part of that competitive landscape, yeah, critical to all of them is that they try they are transparent as possible in showing and documenting the search strategies that were used, uh, and so that you know all those search strategies are, are, are reproducible and, and fully auditable by by the regulatory authorities. Amazing. Thank you. Um, one question in the chat is if participants will be able to receive the recording on the slides. Yes, I will share out the recording to all of you. And then if you'd like to access the, the slides, let me know. And then I'd be happy to share those, those um, apart from the recording as well. Um, okay, one more question here. How does your tool assist with data extraction? Okay, so there was, yeah, I mentioned that as part of the Cure Datas tool. So once you've done your screening, you've, you've, you've used the, the automated uh, PICO annotation to help you understand which articles will be most relevant. You can get those articles via Article Galaxy or unless you have subscriptions to that content already. Then within the Cure Datas, you can annotate the full text um, using a variety of annotation tools. And then that helps you to extract that information that you've annotated um, as part of you know, a, a Prisma workflow in, in line with the Prisma guidelines. So at the moment it, it bring, puts out you know, this information uh, as part of a, as a table basically, which you can then take and use uh, as you need. I think in future we'll be looking closely at the different types of templates which are related re needed for instance for, for case reports and so on. And so that we can also automate that process a little bit more in future as well. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone for asking all these um, really good questions. Looks like we're about to wrap up here. Um, Andrew, if any other questions come up from the audience um, for you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, no, thank you, Julian. Thank you for everybody to today to take part in the, the session. So certainly if you have any follow-up questions for how ICON can help, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to me on, on LinkedIn um, and I can, I can have a further conversation with you then. But thank you everybody for, for taking the time today. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Chris, how about you? Yeah, LinkedIn or email, both are fine. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, Andrew, Chris, thank you so much for this um, really great overview, um, very informative. And um, yeah, really hope to see you on a second webinar sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Julia. Thank right. you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.